Good evening. Welcome. Welcome to tonight's program. I think I know most of you, but I know we have a lot of students back there. Some of them know me because they are interns, and uh, some of them um, I have not had a chance to meet because they are new interns. So I'm really delighted as the Executive Director of Asia Society Hong Kong that I can s um, welcome all of you tonight uh, to the sixth installment of our Chairman's Dialogue. Um, and I think those of you who know, uh, this Chairman's Dialogue really kind of got started in the midst of COVID. And we decided since Ronnie, our chairman, was not traveling, in fact, he had not traveled for three years, and that's a record, uh, we decided that, you know, we, we can still do programs. And so the chairman's dialogue uh, came about so that uh, in the beginning it was all online. Uh, we had, uh, uh, Ronnie was able to speak to uh, Prince Turkey uh, uh, from uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, one of our global trustee, that he was one of the first uh, chairman's dialogue. And and we really are really grateful uh, that you know we didn't just kind of sit around those three years of COVID. We had wonderful programming, many of uh, them online. Uh, we had a COVID update series. In fact, Vivian, thank you for being on COVID my up my COVID update series at least at least twice. So thank you, Vivian, for being here. Um, but so we really made use. Uh, you know, my philosophy was when life throws you lemon, make lemonades. And so Chairman's Dialogue was part of that, and we're really, really excited that um, we launched it. It was about, uh, I think it was May of last year when we did our first Chairman's Dialogue. And so this sixth iteration, this is the first time we're gathering here in person eating. Um, the, the other first two was done online via Zoom, and then the other two was done, we had a reception, um, and uh, but this is the first one that we can gather here. Uh, tonight for, for an in-person and to listen to somebody who is really, um, you know, somebody that I think really requires no introduction, um, our tonight speaker, um, Professor Roger Kronberg, who was the 2006 Chemistry Laureate, and he's the uh, uh, Weinzer Professor in Medicine in the Department of Structural Biology at Stanford University. And just having spent some time uh, with Professor Kronberg earlier uh, before coming over, I think you're going to be, it's going to be a really, really f exciting, fun evening. We're going to learn a lot from uh, Professor Kronberg. And, and I want to remind the students, you guys, this, thanks to uh, one of our PC members, uh, our President Circle member, we have a President Circle table. Thank you, our PC members. Thank you for your support always. We have one uh, PC member, uh, George Long, who could not be with us. He was traveling, but he said, let me sponsor a student table. So we use this opportunity to invite our interns. Um, these interns literally are working for food because we are not paying them. Uh, and they, they are going to be working on, uh, they've been doing all sorts of projects. In fact, I think a few of them are going to be leaving us next week. And some of them just joined us. They're going to be helping us curate a wonderful exhibition that's going to be opening in our Chantal Mella Gallery on August 14th called City of a Contrast. So the interns are curating a photography show about Hong Kong, City of Contrast, with uh, student photographers. So come back on August 14th when, when the exhibition is open to the, uh, to the public. It'll be around for about two, two weeks. So please join us then. Um, this is uh, why I think tonight is so great. We will have um, you know, a world class, uh, as somebody who needs no introduction in Professor Kronberg, and we also have students from uh, the US, uh, from UK, as well as from Hong Kong. So we really, students, be, be, be warned. You are, uh, you will be, Ronnie will be calling on you to ask some of the first uh, questions. And I really want to thank um, uh, our sponsor for this Chairman's Dialogue, Sino Group, and with the support of ANZ, uh, Peter Chen, CEO, Hong Kong. Thank you, Peter, for, for always being there. And, and thank you all for being here tonight. Um, before I close, uh, just a few uh, 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 kind of um, propaganda, I guess, or, 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 or uh, kind of uh, remind you uh, why you should become a member of Asia Society if you are not. So can I see a show of hand who is not a member of Asia Society? Okay. You may want to think twice uh, be about becoming a member now because we have some really exciting program coming up. Uh, for you. Uh, some of the programs, as you know, many of our programs are m open to members and non-members. Uh, for example, next week we're going to do a really interesting program on August 8th. Uh, Professor Puya Aladini, 
uh, in, from University of Tehran is going to talk to us about Iran's middle class. And we're really excited Professor Puya Aladini is going to be here. Um, Puya, I just found out when we were uh, talking, when he was visiting Hong Kong a few, uh, a few months ago, um, he is a fellow Buckeye. And uh, so we, the Ohio State Alumni Association of Hong Kong will be co-sponsoring that program um, on August 8th. And uh, so please join us. Um, it's always great to hear directly from somebody um, living in Iran. I mean, right now we hear a lot of, about things that we're seeing on television. So I'm really excited Puya is going to be joining us um, August 8th. And August 17th, and that is the program that I really would like to call your attention to. And it's only open to our president circle, corporate, and institutional members. And that is Professor Lee Chen. Uh, Professor Lee Chen, just uh, most of you, some of you might know him as Chen Lee. Uh, Professor Lee Chen was at Brookings for about two decades. Um, I knew him uh, when I was working uh, in New York as Committee of 100. And Professor Lee is here. Um, he has just moved here to Hong Kong. Um, uh, since and he's taken up post at Hong Kong U July 1st. He'll be running a, a major uh, China center uh, working directly with the president of Hong Kong U. And Chen has agreed his first program in Hong Kong to be with Asia Society uh, Hong Kong. And it'll be, you know, again, open only to members, uh, PC members, our corporate member and institutional members. And it'll be off the record and we're gonna hear directly from Chen why he decide, decided to move to Hong Kong and, and leave his wonderful job at Brookings and to be among us. So I hope that'll tease you, those of you who are not members yet, because I, I know um, Chen is a very thoughtful uh, scholar and I think you'll really enjoy hearing from him directly. And we also have some wonderful programs coming up on the arts and cultural stuff, uh, arts and cultural programming. Um, I think we have a cello, um, uh, a community cello concert coming up um, and also, ASEAN Film Festival. I think mean, ASEAN has been in the news. Uh, our ch chief executive have been visiting ASEAN, and we're really delighted to be uh, collaborating with the uh, Hong Kong ASEAN Association to be presenting um, the ASEAN Film Festival, which will be taking place uh, August, uh, either here at Asia Society or at M+. So I hope that'll whet your appetite, and I look forward to seeing all of you at our exciting program in August and in, in the uh, months to come. So enjoy your dinner, and student, get your questions ready. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Great to have you all. We are so honored to have Professor Roger Kornberg with us here today. Um, uh, just a couple of minor points that are not that minor. Uh, I asked uh, Professor Kornberg, how many father and son team have ever won Nobel Prize in two generations? And I think the answer is six. Uh, and uh, Roger is one of them. Uh, his father won the Nobel Prize in 1959 in medicine and physiology, uh, and then in 19 uh, 2006, the son uh, received it in chemistry, although I understand they classify you as a structural biologist, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Uh, and uh, I'm so happy when I study that history that uh, your father actually died in 2007 which means that he lived to see his son receive the Nobel Prize. And uh, Roger then told me that his father said, the only thing that is better than receiving my own Nobel Prize in 1959 was to know that my son received the Nobel Prize. Isn't that wonderful? I think that deserves a... <laughs> just a little bit of uh, 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 minor history. Uh, I was uh, with a gentleman in New York City just three weeks ago. And uh, that gentleman was the, he himself is the Nobel laureate, okay, 2013, also in chemistry. And he became the second person to speak at our COVID uh, se uh, series. Uh, Alice Mong started it in February of 2020. So l just weeks after COVID broke uh, to the public, uh, she started the series, and so far we have had 46 editions. And the second one who wrote that, uh, who, who was interviewed by Alice, uh, was Professor Michael Levitt, also from Stanford University, also in chemistry. And uh, I found out that um, although Michael, who is a friend of mine, we had breakfast together in New York recently, 
three weeks ago, although he was only a little bit younger than uh, Professor Kornberg, actually he was really uh, a um, protege to Professor Kornberg that really uh, escorted his career uh, step by step, ended up at, at Stanford University where he eventually in 2013 won the Nobel Prize as well. And uh, I checked and I said, from 2013 onward, uh, no, not onward, starting at 2013 and count backwards for one decade, 10 years, okay? So 03 to 13. How many of those who won the Chemistry Nobel Prize are Jews? Answer is six uh, in 10 years. That's pretty darn good. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if I were a Jew, I might have won the, won the Nobel Prize too. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, Roger happened to be a good friend of my uh, brother, uh, who, as I always say, is far smarter than his brother. Uh, and um, my brother is a scientist, uh, at least he feigns to be one, uh, 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 but he's very much into investment, many of you know. Uh, but the reason, uh, the, the, the subject that I wanted to uh, uh, focus on with uh, Professor Kornberg is that uh, one that is very important to China, and that is basic science. I think Chinese is pretty good in engineering and certain applied sciences, but really without a foundation in basic sciences, you really eventually may run out of uh, gas. Uh, and China knows it, and they are doing their best to really speed up the development of their basic science. The problem, however, it seems to me, is that it really takes time. You, you, you need generations of it to imbibe science, uh, and over a long period of time, Hopefully there's a tradition build up and the top people go into uh, science instead of like in Hong Kong going to business or in Singapore going to the government. Uh, you go into science uh, and, and, and that's how a country can become good. So I want to uh, uh, ask Professor Kornberg uh, to make some comments first, maybe 10, 15 minutes, however, or however long you want to talk about, about basic science in itself. What makes a country or a people or a uh, economy um, competent in basic sciences. Uh, and why uh, is Israel and the Israelite uh, and the Jews so good at it? And then I'd like to also ask you to comment on China because I think you know quite a bit about China. Uh, and by the way, Michael Levitt spends four months in China every year uh, during the COVID. Um, and he was the one, by the way, uh, Roger, that told us three years ago that if China were to open up uh, during COVID time, within six weeks, they will achieve herd immunity. And indeed it happened, except that it was three years later. And bi tens of billions, and if not hundreds of billions of RMB spent. Uh, and, and, and so if we had listened to the scientists, like this one or, or, or his protege, uh, perhaps, uh, the world will be a much better place, uh, economically even, right? Many of us here are businessmen. So comment on, uh, on, on China, comment on uh, science, comment on China-Israel, uh, comment on Israel, uh, their own science. How come you are so damn good? <laughs> I can comment on everything except the last remark that you made. Uh, and uh, I, I would, to make sure I can be heard is the it is good so uh, I would begin by thanking you Ronnie for this opportunity and uh, thanking all of you for joining and I look forward uh, to a discussion and to uh, responding to your interests but let me start out by taking on the topic which Ronnie has mentioned which is dear to my heart uh, and I think it would be best uh, to begin by defining what is basic science and the answer is very simple. It is the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake. Is that a pursuit of knowledge without the solution of any problem in mind? And the irony of the situation is that the, the all great problems are only solved in this way. There is no great problem that has ever been pursued that was solved by 
tackling it directly. The solution to every great problem has always come from pursuing a curiosity about nature. And then uh, ultimately a discovery will be made that leads to the solution of a great problem. Now I could give you many examples uh, and uh, I'll just offer a couple to illustrate the point. Uh, we can talk about modern medicine, but we could equally speak about uh, physics or computer science or engineering. But take the example of medicine, which uh, actually I think I know best and probably most of you as well, and I think it's of greatest concern to us. Uh, human biology matters most to all of us. You may not know that uh, modern medicine is only about 100 years old. Little more than 100 years ago, human disease was attributed to an imbalance of humors. And the only treatments were uh, bleeding and uh, treatments that would elicit, uh, uh, elicit uh, vomiting, regurgitation, what have you. Those were the only treatments violent purgatives and bleeding. Medical science really only began at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. When the first stirrings of medical science uh, became apparent, the then president of Harvard uh, named Eliot, Charles Eliot, uh, advised those who were the leaders of Harvard Medical School uh, to teach science as part of the curriculum. A noted surgeon of the day uh, explained to Eliot that would be impossible because most of the medical students couldn't read or write. <laughs> 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 medical schools of that day were trade schools, places for uh, training people to inflict their ignorance upon the Ill, Ill pop the diseased population. Medical science uh, emerged from chance discoveries that were made over the course of the time. Uh, and I'll, a couple of examples, x-rays. X-rays are crucial for diagnosis. X-rays are very important for therapy. We take it for granted but you may not know that x-rays were discovered by chance. A man, a, a, a German physicist named Rentgen discovered x-rays. A perfect example, Rentgen uh, was expelled from secondary school for drawing caricatures of his teachers. He was never allowed to continue his education. But being a brilliant and creative man, he went on to became a to become a professor of physics at a leading university in Germany. And there one day he was studying the electrical discharge in a cathode ray tube, the kind of uh, what physicists used to use, what used to be related to how televisions would work and so forth. None of that is important anymore, but in any case, at that time it was something quite novel. And he darkened the laboratory in order to observe this electrical discharge and then he noticed in the back of the room there was a glow on a fluorescent screen. He put his hand over the tube and he saw the skeleton of his hand, the bones of his fingers projected on that screen. He won the first Nobel Prize in physics in 1901 because X, the importance of x-rays for medical purposes is immediately appreciated. Fast forward another 50 years, you come to the discovery of penicillin. Now, we antibiotics, as you may not know, but you would doubtless understand, were the most important advance in the history of medicine because most pe people in the past would die of infection before they ever reached old age. A simple scratch could lead to a fatal infection. There's a famous story that antibiotics were discovered also by chance, but by Alexander Fleming, who uh, noticed that a mold that appeared on one of the 
uh, place where he was growing bacteria created a bear zone around it of dead bacteria. As it happens, Fleming could never figure out what was the basis. And he published his work, but it was soon forgotten. Uh, some 10 or 15 years later, uh, the, the phenomenon was taken up again by Ernst Chain, who was a refugee from Nazi Germany. He was not only a scientific, but also a musical genius with a photographic memory. He was studying bacterial cell walls. He was interested in how bacteria form the shell that supports their architecture. He had no interest in antibiotics. He wasn't doing anything except what I have mentioned, pursuing a curiosity about nature, interested in the structure of a bacterial cell. And uh, he thought, well, maybe uh, he could learn more if, it, if he could employ an agent that would break down the cell wall into its components. And with his phenomenal memory, he could recall having read that paper published by Fleming that reported an agent that, that would do harm to bacteria. So he thought perhaps that would attack the cell wall. Well, it happened that indeed uh, an antibiotic interferes with the production of the bacterial cell wall, but more than that, uh, Chain, being a skillful chemist, was able to isolate the unstable material responsible, penicillin. Now, very soon after that, that is in the mold. That was, in was the produced by the mold. Right. That was produced by the mold. Exactly. And uh, the reason why the uh, production and the use of penicillin proceeded very rapidly was the beginning of the Second World War and the desperate need for something to save the lives of injured soldiers. And through then, a remarkable collaboration between scientists and the industry of the time, penicillin was, the production of penicillin was developed, it was mass produced. Even so, in the years immediately after the war, it was still in short supply, and physicians were faced with a terrible choice of to which patients to administer, which lives to save, a problem that, uh, for the most part, of course, they don't face today. These are just two examples. I could give you so many, and in every case, a great problem, such as really the scourge of bacterial disease was solved not by seeking a solution to the problem, but by a chance finding made by someone, as I say, pursuing a curiosity about nature. Now, Ronnie alluded to uh, the development of basic science in China. And it's something that I'm well aware of because I've been much involved in that process. Uh, I was a founding member of the faculty of Shanghai Tech University where I maintain a laboratory and train many students today and where I visit uh, several times a year and of course now with virtual means communicate with my students on a very regular basis. The university was founded by uh, Zhang Minhen, a very fine physicist and a very by now very close friend whose purpose in founding Shanghai Tech was to create a university devoted to basic science. Uh, Minhen saw the importance to China of advancing the training of young people and the pursuit of basic science. He himself having a PhD from what, Drake or Drew University? Yes, yes. And a very fine scientist himself, Minhen. Uh, the son of Zhang Jimin, as you probably know. Uh, Minhen, uh, created a, an institution which is remarkable in many ways. So when uh, I first went to participate in the founding university, it had no venue. There was, uh, we, there was some temporary space that was rented for our laboratories. And he showed me this vast open space where he said the university would be located one day. 
And uh, about a year and a half later, I came and there was the university. <laughs> 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 Filled with magic. <laughs> an absolutely magnificent campus, a, a vast campus not only filled with buildings, but actually far superior to any campus in which I have ever worked. I've worked at, I've been on the faculty at Harvard, I've been on the faculty at Stanford, but I've never been in a ca on a campus as magnificent and well-designed and developed as Shanghai Tech. Well, of course, it takes time. And uh, we at Stanford or my colleagues at Harvard or elsewhere, Cambridge, you name it, we take for granted uh, what enabled us to do, uh, to study, to, perf to be basic scientists in the manner that we are today. It is hundreds of years of the development of science which began in the 16th century with uh, Kepler and Tycho Brahe who made the first accurate measurements and developed the first theory to explain the basis for those measurements, in this case the movement of the planets. and. Over the years, science, the science of physics, of chemistry, of biology, gradually developed in Europe. And as I say, we most often take for granted that heritage. We didn't invent the subject. Uh, we didn't even contribute much to the advance of the subject. It took place over a long period of time. We simply inherited that much as Ronnie has says, implied that I inherited my heritage as a Nobel laureate, well, I must tell you, my wife will assure you it's not a genetic disease. <laughs> <laughs> Give it to me, man. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, China had to start from scratch uh, only a few decades ago to develop uh, a uh, the foundation and then a a whole a basis for uh, this entire di important discipline of fundamental or basic science. And I must say that I thought when we undertook this some decade or only the very beginnings of it a decade or two before, I assumed it would take at least 50 years before that tradition became firmly established. But remarkably, uh, like what I was telling you about the construction of that campus, it has happened. And China has very significant basic science today. Uh, so uh, one of my roles in Shanghai is as uh, chairman of the, what is called the World Laureates Association. Uh, it, is, uh, it began with a meeting that we hold every year in November where uh, almost all living Nobel laureates and winners of other major awards like the Turing Award in Computer Science, the Fields Medal in Mathematics, convene for a uh, couple of days of scientific presentations, all delivered at a level uh, accessible to the lay public because most of us are Thank lay God. citizens when it comes to other scientific subjects. And indeed, we intend that uh, very soon that forum will be held in Hong Kong uh, and from time to time elsewhere in China and perhaps even in the world as well. Uh, in uh, the course of my service as chairman of the World Laureates Association, uh, the idea developed of building a laboratory uh, with a special purpose that I can explain, but uh, briefly to enhance the development of basic science, especially in China, but worldwide, and to enhance the careers of young basic scientists. And I could tell you if anyone wants to know why they are an endangered species, but that is indeed the case today. Well, uh, we held a scientific symposium last week to inaugurate the uh, development of that laboratory. Shanghai? This was in Shanghai, and it was a high-level scientific conference in one area of uh, biological science. And many of the contributors were uh, young Chinese scientists working at the major universities in China, at Shanghai Tech, at Fudan University, at Westlake, at other universities, and they gave brilliant lectures. 
and their work was cutting edge, their presentations world class, showing that the country has arrived as also a place for basic science. I shouldn't go on any longer. Um, Great. But uh, Ronnie, please. Can I ask, uh, delve a little bit into history, huh? Uh, I went to university in the late 60s and early 70s. And in those days, you have to study German because uh, German, uh, Germany was a leader in the scientific field perhaps until the 60s and 70s maybe. And then s after my generation, not my generation, after my class, nobody study German anymore, uh, or at least need to study German anymore because you speak English, everything is in the English language. Uh, so you may say that in some way the English speaking world, in particular the United States, has uh, surpassed uh, Germany as a leader in the scientific field. Why is that the case? The answer is very simple. And, and, and what will be the Adolf, next? Adolf Hitler. Oh. So s you may not know, the United States was not a leader in world science until the Second World War. Uh, in fact, it was not even a second-rate power in science until the Second World War. So after, be ben after Benjamin Franklin, there wasn't much to brag about <laughs> in American <laughs> science. The uh, Germany was indeed the world leader in science, and uh, and I have to say that almost all of the great German scientists were Jewish. And uh, those who could escape with their lives came to America. Uh, sadly, very many perished, murdered by the Nazis. And they created what today we call American science and catapulted American science from a very, a very insignificant level to world leadership. What lingered was the use of the German language. The reason is so much of the literature was written in German. So when I was a student in chemistry, I was a graduate student in chemistry and chemical physics at Stanford in the 1960s, I was still, like you, required to learn German and also French, as it happens. Well, I managed to cheat my way out of it and <laughs> fake <laughs> the knowledge of German and French and graduate with a PhD. But fortunately, cheating in that way was not uh, ultimately detrimental <laughs> because uh, it didn't matter. Didn't but then a few years later, uh, English had become the language of science, which I've always thought was an unfair advantage of native English speakers because communication is so important. Yeah. Communication is half the battle. Discovering something is the first half, but if you can't communicate it well, and I don't mean just articulate, but convey the information and spread the word, then what was the point of making that discovery in the first place? The impact will be minimal. So I've always felt that we, as English speakers, as native English speakers, have an unfair advantage. And it's why I've encouraged universities that I've, in which I've taken part, in Korea and China and elsewhere, to make a special point of offering advanced language instruction to their graduate students, and it's not done enough. In Hong Kong, you, you don't suffer from this limitation because of your history and because of the capabilities of the people here, which impress me so much, but you may not appreciate how much of a limitation, uh, what a handicap it is for uh, Chinese in the mainland, uh, for people not only elsewhere in Asia, but even in Europe, young French people Young Spaniards can barely speak English at all. Huge disadvantage. So coming to your comment, Ronnie, um, I would strongly advocate for making a special effort to teach English. The last two tables. Those are the students, the young <laughs> people. <laughs> now let me uh, pick up on something. Um, <coughs> um, so well, at, at the table we were talking that uh, I did some study a couple of years ago. I found out that something like 36, 37% of all the Nobel laureates in uh, medicine and physiology, uh, 50, 35, 36% of chemistry, 30% of physics, uh, and then I don't know, 30, 40% of economics in Nobel Prize were, were all Jewish. And uh, when I said that, 
uh, Roger had a very interesting uh, comment. <laughs> he said it would. The only reason is not 50 percent is because of uh, Hitler. Anti-Semitism. And yeah. anti-Semitism. Uh, so let's make sure that the world doesn't get to that kind of a place. Uh, so that w brains of whoever background ethnicity uh, will be preserved in order for the common good of uh, the world. On China, um, I was told that uh, at the highest level of s scientific uh, pursuit, uh, you really have to be very creative. I don't understand that word, okay? Because I'm not creative. Uh, so, so, <laughs> so, and it is said that the Chinese are not that creative people because of rope learning and all that kind of stuff. Is it going to impede China's development of basic science? Or as one, by the way, Professor Kornberg uh, really mentored a lot of young people. Michael uh, Levitt is one that became a Nobel laureate, and then somebody who spoke here twice, Ada Yonat, uh, from Weizmann Institute, uh, also chemistry Nobel laureate in 2009, I believe it was, uh, was also uh, very much uh, helped by Roger. And so, so what can, uh, is that really true? And how can China do better in order to be more, because Ada Yunai gave us a, a lecture here on curiosity. And so how can we make the Chinese more curious, more creative? So the Chinese people are equally capable as Jewish people of uh, both uh, scholarship and creative activity, equally capable. And I, I must say that uh, it has, at least in part, to do with uh, the culture and the upbringing. And uh, I can explain in a, in, in a, few, in a couple of different ways. Jewish people are, uh, young Jewish kids are not very well behaved. <laughs> and that- You're right. And Gil is an example. My youngest uh, son yeah. can attest to that, and he's the misbehaving The reason I don't already. have a Nobel Prize is I was <laughs> Taguayla. I was too good a kid. And, uh, and their parents tolerate it or even encourage it. Uh, young Chinese, Chinese people in general show remarkable respect for their parents and their elders. Isn't it bad? And I uh, think that that is a wonderful thing for parents, but it's not the best thing for the children. <laughs> uh, th there's a, a, an event which happens every year uh, in uh, uh, southern Germany uh, called, in a place called Lindau, where uh, Nobel laureates are invited to meet together with young scientists at the time, all from Europe. Uh, that has changed in a way that I can explain. Uh, Wan T. Lee had much to do with making it happen in Asia as well, but Who that's another story. Yeah. Y. T. Lee, Wan oh, T. Lee. Oh, the Taiwan, uh, yes. uh, Li Guoting. Yeah, a very close friend and responsible for making the Great. same thing happen. Yeah. Well, I have refused for the last 15 years ever to participate. Why? And the reason is, because I believe young people should not uh, sit at the feet of their scientific elders and engage in that form of adulation. What I would encourage is a healthy disrespect for their elders. I think it's important that they not, exactly, that they not accept. In fact, this is the way I was raised. My father encouraged my brothers and me to disregard or even disrespect him. And that was the most fortunate, most fortunate experience of my life. I've known the children of many other Nobel laureates, and I'm afraid that most were adversely affected by the celebrity of their parents, by their, usually their fathers. Uh, in my case, in my brother's case, I actually thought my father was a pedestrian, maybe not even a mediocre scientist, because really? he told me so. <laughs> and he assured me that uh, whatever he, were his failings, my brothers and me would go on to achieve much greater things. Wow. When I was an undergraduate, near the end of my period as an undergraduate at Harvard University, my father was invited to come and give a lecture. 
And I was terribly embarrassed because I was sure that his mediocrity would be revealed. <laughs> <laughs> now, by then, he was the leading biochemist in the world. Right. But I had no idea. I thought he was just at best a mediocre scientist. You're a little dumb, Roger. It wasn't, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't until years later that I realized that he was one of the greatest scientists of his age, and by then it was too late to do damage to my own arrogance, my own self-esteem. A healthy disrespect for one's elders. That is the secret, I believe, to uh, the uh, development of creativity in young people. They have to break free from the past and they have to imagine a new beginning. Well, Jonathan, tell us later why China will be having a problem because <laughs> our children are too quiet, uh, too, too, too uh, obedient to Now, us. I might point out that there have been many Nobel Prizes won by people of Chinese ethnicity who worked in America, most of them uh -huh. who grew up uh, were raised in America. The Chinese people are just as capable, maybe even more capable. Uh, and one day there will be many Nobel Prizes awarded to uh, mainland Chinese, Hong Kong Chinese people. Um, it, the time will come, but again, healthy disrespect for one's elders. That is the key. A little test for everybody here. How, m how many Nobel laureates have, has Hong Kong produced? I mean, born, bred, educated in Hong Kong, high school, primary school, how many? How many? One, who's that? Sui Qi, right? And then we have one uh, fuse medalist, Sheng uh, Tong Yao, who spoke here several times, right? So uh, maybe there's, there's hope to us. Yep, there is, it will, it's unavoidable, it will happen. Now you there will be many, and, and in the future, in time, most will come from China, simply because Number. of numbers, uh, because uh, the uh, extraordinary opportunities that will exist here for people who are capable of that level of performance. And so India should have an equal chance. India, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I have visited India many times, and uh, was once shown the entrance exam for one of the uh, Chinese, uh, one of the Indian Institutes of Technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, I couldn't answer a question on that exam. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was because written in Hindi, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mentioned that chance discovery huh, uh, is so critical to actual ultimate application. So numbers does, big number does help, isn't it? If it's by chance you have more people doing it, even if they are not as good as uh, somewhere else, uh, they only get 95% of as, as good, but the, the size of it is gonna bingo, you're gonna get it. Uh, Ronnie, uh, you're very clever. You put your, you no, you actually put your finger on it. That is exactly the point. So it's, uh, it's very difficult to persuade the only p people who really would support fundamental science, and that is, the politicians who pass the legislation appropriating funds for the purpose. Very hard to persuade them to support people to do things which have no obvious purpose. Right. The, uh, I have tried to explain in testimony before the U.S. Congress and before uh, various select committees of the Congress and even in the White House, the secret to success is to play the numbers game. Exactly that. You don't know, it is, after all, think the definition of a discovery is something unexpected. So you can't predict it. So politicians can't do what they would like, which is to make a plan and cause it to happen. I tell them that you can't make a plan. You can only play that numbers game. I tell them that if you support a large enough number of bright young people to pursue their curiosity, they will make the discoveries needed to solve every problem on the planet. That is the only way to do it. And that is the spirit behind the new laboratory that we're building in Shanghai. So when this was actually proposed to me, I was at first uh, unsure of the, po of the purpose. I, I, they wanted me to be the president of this new thousand scientist laboratory. And I said, what do we need another research institute for? There are so many in the world. And you know, I have better things to do with my time than run another laboratory. 
And then it occurred to me that it could be different from all the others. I said, you know, the problem that young people face today, even more than in the past, is gaining independence to do work of their own devising at an age when they can still be original. The fact is, for reasons that now we can discuss, almost all discoveries are made by people in their 20s and 30s. I did all my important work when I was in my 20s. Actually, I keep trying to make a discovery, but I know full well that I'll never do it again. <laughs> the uh, important work is done by young people. It relates to what we were discussing a moment ago. But young people today, young scientists, face an even greater obstacle than they did in the past to gaining the independence to pursue work of their own choosing and devising, uh, especially in Europe, in Japan, and I'm afraid also in China, uh, young people, when they complete their training, uh, are appointed assistant professors or associate professors, but they're not really uh, faculty members in the true sense of the word. They are appointed to serve underneath people more senior who will direct their research. They may never gain independence, or it may come at a later age. Even in the United States, where early independence has been the watchword, for other reasons, uh, the average age of gaining independence is 41 today. In China or in, in America? In the United States. Really? In the United States, that where at least it happens, they are already almost too old to be original. So the new laboratory in Shanghai uh, will, thanks to actually Li Chun, who was the person who will sponsor this, uh, and uh, thanks to his agreement, uh, his uh, consent to this plan, will house 200 research groups of only five members each, very small labs, each led by a young person who just completed his train, his or her training, and the it will be the only place in the world where young people, in this case, two hundred young people, will have a chance to discover something. And what I what I told Li Chun is, it isn't only that this will give young people a chance to develop their careers, but the chances are that in that from that laboratory will come more discoveries from than from any of the universities or other research institutes because these are the people who have at least the chance of discovering something. To be honest, when I first heard about that organization with the laboratory, I thought to myself, what the heck? I have no idea why now, it, this is the first time I've heard why you, know, you want to have that laboratory. And I remember Sheng Tong Yao, the Fuse medalist, uh, said to me one time, he said, Ronnie, by the time you're 34, you have peaked out in your ingenuity and uh, in your creativity and whatever. Uh, and, 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 and so, you know, if you don't get them when they're young, uh, if you, uh, you're really missing a lot of opportunities. So as I say, the symposium that we held uh, just last week was to inaugurate uh, the laboratories. Uh, the one of the great challenges is to fund the laboratory. And the reason is that we uh, have decided that it must be entirely privately funded. And the reason for that is that it should be an international institution and there should be no government anywhere that is associated with it. Um, it has to have this kind of spirit of complete independence, and it, we will succeed in that. But today, uh, America is seriously blocking uh, people flow, in particular science uh, top talents. Uh, How would that affect the world in the coming decades? So. Probably most of you know that American science is not American. Amer American science okay. is international. I always point out to right. people that in my own laboratory of anywhere over the years, it used to be about 25 students, uh, now uh, fewer, about 12 to 15 students. Uh, typically, two or three will be American. Uh, the rest will come from every country in the world. I've had India, fantastic India. students from China, great mm -hmm. students from every place you can think of, from Argentina, from Mexico, from, uh, from France, from Spain, from Sweden, uh, Germany, Israel, on down the line. 
And that is not unusual, that is typical. America achieved greatness in science. I should say at the time when I was a student, uh, so again in the 1960s, uh, the balance uh, in really uh, world leading science was about 50-50 between the US and Europe. Uh, by the 80s, it was 80-20 US versus Europe. And, uh, and it was due to the fact that European science was European. Almost everyone in a French laboratory was French. Almost everyone in a Spanish laboratory was Spanish. But almost everyone in an American laboratory came from some other place in the world. So the best and the brightest in the world were attracted to American laboratories where you, you can't lose. So, um, okay. Um, if the Chinese leaders were to come to you and say, Professor Kornberg, uh, what do we need to do to uh, give ourselves a better future in terms of basic sciences, what would you advise? So the most important thing is, again, to foster the careers of young investigators, to give them early independence in their research, and to attract an international community of young investigators. Now, the laboratory that I mentioned uh, is going to uh, be populated uh, and respond to a call for applications that we will publish in the leading magazine, Science Magazine Nature, uh, for uh, people who have, again, just completed training anywhere in the world, and they will be selected on the basis of merit alone. And we expect that about half will come from China, and we expect about half will come from the US and Europe. Now, that has many additional benefits. These people will form a community working together as they do. Um, it will be an international community whose connections will persist long after they leave there. Uh, and it's that kind of thing which needs to be fostered. Hong Kong has a particular advantage because it has an international character. And that could be exploited. Uh, I'm sure it already is and should uh, be exploited even more fully in the future for this purpose. Uh, I'll ask mm -hmm. the next question since 50% of the audience here uh, are, are, are female. How about women scientists? Uh, should we foster more uh, women in the science, and how do we do that? So in the first place, of course, yes, uh, uh, women are, men and women are equally capable of scientific discovery. Women have uh, not uh, become scientists uh, in the past in anything like the numbers of men, in part because of their upbringing, in part because of other societal influences, uh, in part because the challenges they even face if they decide they want to become a scientist. Now, we've tried hard in American universities, and I'm sure you try here, to remove those obstacles, but they still exist. Uh, there is still a bias often in just an implicit bias, and it will just take continuing to try to overcome those limitations, as simple as that. But what about mathematics? Um, that is one area that is more skewed than chemists, mm -hmm. physicists, uh, biologists. Why is that the case? Is it so abstract? But I thought the women are even better at abstract thinking. Well, Stanford's field medalist in mathematics was a woman. Yes, uh, Iranian. Actually, right? er, of Persian origin, exactly. Uh, sadly, she died of breast cancer at a very young age. Very uh, and there's no doubt that there could be many more. And it's for the same reasons that uh, there are societal or other uh, uh, implicit or otherwise unspoken pressures, prejudices, biases that tend to direct people towards other pursuits. We can have for now 15, 20 minutes uh, for a Q&A. Anybody from the floor, anyone want to ask anything? Raise your hand. If not, I got plenty of questions. So the, 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 the intern at the back. Um, do you believe that the study of a science subject should be made mandatory at certain levels of schooling? The study of? At least one science subject. One and science subject. Mm. Look, in the first place, I think it is extraordinary 
that human biology is not a required, basic human biology is not a required subject for every student in every university in the world. You know, it's amazing that uh, in the United States, the system which differs from Europe, and I don't know the system here very well, uh, is supposed to be a general education. And it always begins in the first year with required courses in the history of, West, of, of thought and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and a number of other areas. And the students are required for the entirety of their, of their undergraduate career at least to study one science course. So a student uh, in art or in politics may only take one such course, and it can be geology or it can be uh, something in, in uh, basic physics. Uh, it can be in mathematics. How can you go through life as a biological creature without fundamental knowledge of human biology? It's just outrageous. So the answer is, to begin with, everyone should learn basics of human biology so they know how to lead their lives in a safe and uh, effective manner. Uh, the, the, beyond that, the question you ask, should you focus on one subject, well, the answer, of course that is done, but to varying degrees. So in, 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 an, in the American system, you can have a major subject that occupies only a fraction, perhaps a quarter of your time. In other systems, in Israel, for example, um, I think still in Europe today, uh, specialization begins at the beginning of undergraduate study. Uh, if you want to become a doctor in the end, you already start at the beginning studying almost entirely scientific subjects. And you're deprived of a general education. You may be surprised to know my major subject at Harvard was English literature. Really? And I think it was the m most valuable part of my education because it was really important training in expression, in communication, in the ability to convey ideas. Uh, and I think that I benefited enormously from that. In fact, the chairman of the Nobel Committee, who was responsible for my prize, uh, told me that m the, the, the writing of my papers, the way in which they were written, made a big difference <laughs> to the award. Uh. They, he could read them, and he, and he found the argument compelling, and he could understand it. Uh, Sarah Cooper in front here, and then Jonathan Drew, and then over there, right here. Thank you, so interesting. Scientifically speaking, uh, taken for, I think, given that, you, that your knowledge surpasses uh, everyone else's here, what field or what specific thing excites you most? What are we going to see in the next few years that you think uh, is, is most exciting? So I often say that the 20th century was the age of physics. The 21st century, the one we're living in now, the age of biology, and especially the age of human biology. And there are uh, many good reasons for that, and, is not, and it is not to discount the importance of physics or chemistry, which is uh, my main subject. Uh, after all, biology uh, can only be understood in chemical terms. Nevertheless, the age of biology in every respect, the age of biology in regard to the focus of science, the directions of science, indeed already <coughs> in every department of physics in every department of chemistry, in every university in the world, you will find <coughs> many who study biological subjects. <coughs> Excuse me. They may study from the standpoint of physics or applying physical theory, <coughs> but they're studying biological problems. And uh, it applies equally to the application of what is found. Uh, biotech which actually only began a few decades ago, is gaining importance <coughs> in every area, economic as well as medical, and it will continue to grow in significance and become the dominant 
driver of economics in the future for sure. Jonathan? Jonathan Drew from Bank uh, Canada. Yeah. I uh, wanted to ask about Israel because, uh, you know, I think, uh, Ronnie, when you started, you were saying, promising that uh, Roger would talk a little bit about Israel. I mean, Israel is a relatively small country with a population that's not very different from Hong Kong. What did Israel do right to make Israel today such a center for innovation, for entrepreneurship? And what can Hong Kong learn from Israel to make Hong Kong a center of, of uh, of scientific innovation, of scientific uh, research, and as well as entrepreneurship. So, uh, by the way, Professor Kornberg does live in Jerusalem. So there are other places. There, are doubtless, many reasons, and of course, it's always hard to be sure you got the right answer to a question like that, because in there are for sure multiple factors. I can give you some of the reasons, um, others such as the gentleman sitting two seats behind you, the consul from Israel, probably could do an even better job of answering the question. But uh, it begins with what we discussed a moment ago. Uh, young people in Israel have had the opportunity uh, to develop in the way young people did in the past in the United States, gain early independence in research. Uh, and uh, it is, to begin with, uh, the uh, efforts of young people uh, with an entrepreneurial bent uh, that have underpinned uh, the emergence of Israel as one of the most prosperous nations with one of the highest per capita incomes on earth. I mean, I often point out that uh, only uh, about 40 years ago when uh, I married an Israeli and took up residence in Israel, it was still, uh, in economic terms, a third world country. Um, it has succeeded in this way in spite of being in a state of war with its neighbors for the entire time, maintained a vibrant democracy, and achieved this extraordinary growth and prosperity based on no natural resources but only the intellectual ability of its people and their entrepreneurial skill. So it begins with the people. Well, you have people here with all of the same capabilities and given the opportunity, they will do uh, just as well. Beyond that, the government has made, taken important steps to facilitate uh, entrepreneurial development. And I'm less of an expert than the gentleman behind you on the subject, but it is a fact that it has found ways of facilitating economic development that have been, I think, copied elsewhere since that time, having to do with tax status, having to do with uh, grants of government money to enable, through the chief scientist in Israel, the uh, early development of startup companies and so forth. Uh, Israel is extraordinarily idea-rich, uh, but still even uh, economically so, venture uh, capital poor. Uh, so if you're impressed by what has been accomplished, I can tell you the potential is far greater than what has been achieved. Is the fact that you have an existential threat, does it somehow come into play? Uh, I don't think that is a driver. I think it's extraordinary that it could be in some way uh, dealt with and still this uh, accomplished, still so much accomplished. The gentleman on the right, and then followed by Janet Powell, and then El Reyes. Great, thank you for a brilliant talk. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, just wanna know what you think about the recent <coughs> rise of anti-intellectualism and anti-science and science denialism, and what as obviously relatively educated people we can do to help combat in that, and what does the role of education have in that? So I often point out that uh, I lived, I grew up in a bubble of uh, a special appreciation and emphasis given to intellectual activity. Uh, it wasn't true in the f so much in the first half of even the 20th century, and uh, I say a bubble because, as you rightly point out, there's a worrisome 
retrenchment in that regard in the world today. And there are a number of factors. Uh, they have to do with this rise of uh, populism that resents wha what are called the elites. It has to do with greed, uh, with a rush to exploit whatever has been found uh, to make money and at the expense of maintaining, of nurturing the source, which is fundamental studies, which is scholarship, which is the pursuit of knowledge. You ask what can be done, uh, and I always give this, the same answer to all of these issues, whether it be the survival of the Jewish people and the state of Israel, whether it be uh, the preservation of intellectual pursuit and the advancement of human progress on that basis, whatever it may be, uh, that these are not battles that are ever won, that they must be fought in every generation. And uh, I do what I can to uh, d advance these concerns in my own and the young people sitting in the back, um, they're going to have to carry the baton and defend these important concerns in the next generation. Thank you. Janet Thank you. Powell of Asia Business Council and Ned L. Reyes of Hong Kong U and Asia Society. Thank you, Ronnie, and thank you, uh, Professor Kornberg. Uh, I guess my question is to some extent asked by the gentleman there, so I'm going to ask another question. Um, my question is, given the advent of uh, an acceleration of artificial intelligence um, and here in Asia especially, especially in a lot of developing countries, some of the aspiring young skilled graduates would have wanted to go into science, but now they're saying, well, I'm not really sure if I should go into certain kinds of sciences or applied sciences. Will AI take my job? Uh, and will there be fewer jobs for me in the future if I go into science? So how would you counter that? And what would be some kind of encouraging, convincing words you could give to educators and parents to encourage their future generation to go into science? So and, and will AI begin to be able to make scientific discoveries? <laughs> So the question is actually best answered by my son in the audience, but I will repeat what he tells me. <laughs> so there are answers to both your question and Ronnie's closely related question, uh, which, uh, uh, as I say, for the most part, I will uh, repeat from what I have learned from him. He uh, has a degree from Stanford University in artificial intelligence, but has proved to be also a very quick learner in regard to basic science, including biological science, and speaks to the subject in a thoughtful way. So he has pointed out to me to begin with that AI is only as good as the data upon which it is based. And indeed, the power of AI is limited by the data available today. So the, r the greatest need is for expanding the amount of information so the full power of AI can be realized and brought to bear on problems to which it may be applied. The, uh, the, the second point, uh, which really I think comes to Ronnie's question, can AI make discoveries? Uh, well, indeed, uh, my son Gil is interested in uh, the application of AI for that very purpose. Uh, the it is an unanswered question. We don't know to the, the extent to which it can reveal something unexpected that would qualify as a discovery on the scale of what we spoke of earlier. Gil, you want to add something? That's Gil, why don't you take the microphone yeah, take and the microphone give a better uh, answer yeah, than yeah, I have yeah, done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, be irrelevant, uh, irreverent. Irreverent, uh, yes. Right, right. right. Uh, forget about he's your Disrespectful, father. that won't yeah, be a problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of practice. <laughs> um, it was a Chinese s physicist at Stanford, Xu Cheng Zhang, who uh, described Chang, what yeah. uh, I now call the Zhang test. It says the Turing test, which uh, we are by now all familiar with, whether or not a machine can fool a human in a dialogue into thinking that it too is a person is not 
the right benchmark for human intelligence. Rather, scientific discovery is. And he showed that the same methods used to train, design and train chat GPT could discover the organization of the periodic table of the elements, perhaps the most important scientific discovery of all time. Um, but it was actually with my uh, dinner partner that I was discussing Moravec's paradox, which says that it is relatively uh, easy, trivial, to train an AI to do something like pass a medical exam or the bar, but we haven't the vaguest idea how to design an AI to explore the world and acquire knowledge like a child. And it is those same mechanisms, and perhaps this is why people in their 20s and 30s so often are the ones making discoveries because they're still not fully developed, um, that we will need to understand in order to bring AI to bear on true scientific discovery. Well now, said. I see that the son is smarter than the father, but <laughs> that's good. El Reyes and then the he student. Benefits, the he benefits from that healthy disrespect <laughs> for his elder. <laughs> Indeed. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering if I could bring this to a very higher, uh, higher level, uh, bring the world of cinema in. Uh, right now, the world of cinema. cinema. The, oh, okay. The, 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 the cinema. One very popular movie, of course, is the movie Oppenheimer. Um, I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, regardless, oh, but I've read the book American yes, Prometheus. Yes, American Prometheus. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if you could just comment on, particularly now that we've just been discussing AI, uh, some of the issues that were brought up by this film and by the book, uh, particularly the responsibility of science scientists uh, when it comes to creating uh, such a powerful tool. Thank you. So it's a question that's been asked in other contexts and in the biological one with respect to what is called recombinant DNA uh, and the ability to create even, uh, either variant or entirely new organisms. And uh, people often ask whether such science should be pursued because it may lead to dangerous ends. And the answer is you cannot prevent it. You can't stop people thinking, questioning, and pursuing knowledge in any area. It is the, not the responsibility of scientists to decide the application of the knowledge which they acquire. That is the responsibility of society. Scientists can discover knowledge, but they have no greater ability or right <coughs> than all the other members of the society to determine its use. <coughs> so the ethical questions do not belong to scientists. Ethical questions belong to the world at large, to people in general, and we hope that they make the right decisions. What happened to that Chinese guy then, <laughs> the, the biologist who tried to, uh, what do you call it? Uh, right, uh, who uh, <coughs> undertook gene editing right. in, an irrespons in an irresponsible manner. The answer was that their idea did not exist at the time or there were not properly applied regulations Indeed, the response was of society that I alluded to for the control of use of technology developed by scientists. Uh, and uh, ultimately, I know that the Chinese government, like any other, responded in the appropriate manner. The student at the back. The Thank you for inspiring speech, sir. As you mentioned at the very beginning, a launch of basic science is very important because a lot of peers I know that they are complaining about the science lessons they have is very difficult and it's pretty boring. I, I would like to ask you the advice of how to make students to encourage them to discover their own sciences, uh, this journey, and what would you think schools or teachers should do and what would be your advice? Thank you. So, so you ask a very important question <coughs> and one that is difficult to answer because uh, in general, science is very poorly taught, and young people who will decide to continue in science, are, um, who may wish to continue, are often discouraged. I, I give the example of uh, a, a time recently when I was asked to 
participate in the sophomore dinner at Stanford. So this is when uh, students in their second year are now asked to make a decision of what is their major subject uh, relating to a question that was asked earlier. And I was seated at a table with a group of young people who had entered Stanford with an interest in biology and chemistry. And I was astonished to learn that all of those young people who came intending to pursue study in biology and chemistry decided to study something else. It only took one year to immunize them <laughs> against the study of their favorite subject. It was so poorly taught. And as I questioned them further, of course I learned what was the reason. <clears throat> it was because they were inundated with information they were asked to learn and regurgitate on examinations. And after that, I appealed to the chairman of the Department of Chemistry, who I knew well, and also uh, the leadership in biology. I said, you know, only one thing matters when you teach. Only one thing. It makes no difference what anybody learns. They needn't learn a single fact. It only matters that they're more interested at the subject at the end than they were at the beginning. Nothing else matters. I explained because if that is true, they will remember something which they learned. Otherwise, they will assuredly forget whatever you try to force them to learn. And if that is true, they will go on to learn more. Uh, sadly, that advice <laughs> was not taken. <laughs> and generation after generation of young people who entered the university wishing to study biology and chemistry go on to do something else. The answer is the teaching is part of the problem. But beyond that, in answer to your question, uh, I think that a young person who is motivated and would like to do it has to reach outside what they are taught, um, has to study something which they especially enjoy about the subject. Uh, because the, the, the routine, the rote learning, most of it doesn't matter anyway. You know, when I was an undergraduate, perhaps you were an undergraduate, uh, I actually didn't do any homework. Uh, you graduate Because it only, because all the grade was based only on the final exam. Mm. And I went and I read about aspects of the subject that interested me. And one attracted my attention particularly called, a subject called magnetic resonance. And I decided to do graduate study in that area. And that was the foundation of my career in science. So you went from English literature to management residence. So I, I took, I, I was fortunate to be in a, a special yeah. chemistry program at Harvard uh, where uh, I, I could take the liberty that I've mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> and I was intrigued by one subject that was mentioned in the course of that training magnetic resonance, and I decided I was going to learn everything I could about it. And I forgot about all the rest. Well, just a little story about your friend. He is a friend uh, who has degrees in aeronautical engineering, geofluid dynamics, and physics. And then he bumped into one teacher in biology that intrigued him so much that after three degrees, uh, he changed course <laughs> and became a biologist for the rest of his life, um, and uh, that's my brother. Yes. Uh, I uh, <laughs> so uh, last question, Alice Mong, uh, our executive director. Any more students? If the students have any more questions, we'll let the students uh, ask more questions, okay? Uh, okay, you're young enough. Later, after Alice. Alice, you okay. go first. You I leave I the I'll last I'll one. make it short. Um, but um, uh, Professor Mumford, before uh, dinner at, at the office, you mentioned um, uh, Edda Yonath. Uh, who was on the stage twice. And you are know, you not a chemistry 2009 Nobel laureate and you, Weissman? You mentioned her contribution and, and how you have uh, helped her in terms of recognition, getting the, the, the Nobel recognition that, that she well deserved. Um, one uh, Chinese woman scientist I've always been fascinated with, uh, uh, Wu Jianxiong. Uh, she was a founder of Committee 100. And based on her work, I think that the two Chinese uh, Nobel laureates uh, have won their Nobel Prize 
not her. Yeah, Xian and, Yang and uh, Li Zhengdao. And she apparently was part of the Manhattan Project, uh, uh, my understanding is. So, you know, going back to Ronnie's question earlier about women in science, and, you know, what it, it does it take? We have a lot of young women a young uh, uh, who might be interested. And going back to what you said about teaching, uh, it, is that also one of the problem, is that the teaching is inhibiting uh, uh, young women from wanting to be pursue a career in science? So I, I've been told that is also part of the problem, that uh, teachers don't have the same expectations of women as men. Uh, my daughter, who is a political scientist, um, and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, a very uh, uh, capable young scholar, uh, told me that Amongst many examples of the kind of thing that you allude to uh, is a study that revealed how often women, how often parents will ask the question, is my son a genius or is my daughter a genius? And they will always ask, is my son a genius? But they will almost <laughs> never ask, is my daughter a genius? That bias begins long before training, long before teaching. It's a part of upbringing and it extends throughout life. My daughter is a genius because I Bravo. have no daughter in the family. <laughs> 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 Last question to the young man here. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Professor Kornberg. Uh, my name is Anton. I'm a first year undergrad at MIT looking to do biology and I'm happy to report that after my year, I'm still in the field. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, my question to you is also about biology. There's something that you said during your talk about um, having the numbers uh, will let it lead us to discoveries. I'm, I'm just so curious as to why we have so few choices as to model organisms. So all of your work in nucleosomes, in polymerases, they're all in yeast. We're limited to E. coli, to satellites, to, to mice, to baboons. Why can't we look at all the animals, all the organisms in the world so that we can truly understand what biology is? So uh, the reason why there was an early focus on bacteria and when attention turned to eukaryote organisms, people in the audience may not appreciate that fungi are fundamentally different from bacteria and more similar to humans. When there was an interest in human biology, studies of yeast proved to be very valuable. In fact, on the, in my own work, as you indicated, the machinery for reading genetic information is 50% identical between fungi and humans. Obviously, therefore, uh, advantageous for us to study in fungi. The reason uh, was and has been for a long time that the uh, all of the tools needed, uh, and there are many different methods that are required to make uh, meaningful studies and penetrate deeply to the answers of important questions uh, uh, have been developed for one organism or another. And to start over with a new organism would really require reinventing the wheel. Um, so when we began, for example, our studies in yeast, we could take advantage of literally decades of development of the technology for analyzing the yeast genome for analyzing the components of yeast cells, for growing yeast under various conditions to elicit their behaviors. Uh, now, others have introduced uh, new organisms to the panoply of those that are available to study. And uh, just to give one example, uh, the uh, Xenorhabditis uh, elegans, the, uh, a, 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 a worm, of minuscule size, it was taken up by a man named Sidney Brenner because it offered advantages not available from other organisms of a very small size, only a thousand cells, but with a central nervous system. So it was amenable for study, if you like, of principles underlying neuronal development in the brain, a transparent organism, so you could see through it to tell what everything was happening a very short generation time, every four days. Uh, other advantages, it's a, a self-fertilizing hermaphrodite, which is advantageous for genetics. What came out of Sydney's introduction of Cyanorhabditis elegans 
was nothing relating to his purposes. It was discovery of two, pro two important findings that led to Nobel Prizes. One, programmed cell death. And the other, small interfering RNA. The people who sat with we at dinner learned that small interfering RNA, RNA is the basis of a technology that we have developed which will assure there will never be another pandemic. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, for those of you who want to learn more about that, no more pandemics, uh, perhaps after dinner, you can hang around and talk to the professor. In fact, he's too humble. He, his technology, his science and so forth led to, if you don't mind my saying this, a company that is now uh, producing, uh, working on these uh, things that hopefully will be able to save the world from future pandemics. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a great privilege and honor to be here in this room. Uh, it's not because of A Society, it's because of the people that we bring to, uh, by A Society to our midst, and such as uh, the 2006 Nobel Laureate in Chemistry, Professor Roger Convert. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause to our speaker. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.